two utes behind me probably need no introduction. In 2022, the Toyota Hilux and the Ford Ranger were Australia's two top selling vehicles. You're probably already well aware, but in 2022, Ford launched a new generation Ranger. And with that came a series of improvements to refinement, technology, and powertrain. Chief amongst those is the option of a V6 turbo diesel engine. And for now, it's a bit of an exclusive in the segment. Toyota, meanwhile, topped the 2022 sales charts with the Hilux. Australia's favorite car knows that it's got a battle on its hand, however. So the top spec Rogue has seen some changes that you don't normally see in the middle of a model run. Wider wheel arch flares house wider track suspension. There's new suspension arms up front and track widths are pushed out by 140 millimeters overall. Hilux gets a 20 millimeter bump in ride height and things like the rear shocks have been pushed further outboard to increase stability. There's something else that's new for the Hilux too. For the first time, it runs disc brakes on the rear axle, which is in uh, keeping up with what the Ranger has done. Those aren't the kind of changes that you would normally see in a model year update. So it's pretty clear that Toyota sees the new Ranger as a bit of a threat. For now though, Toyota doesn't have an answer to the Ranger's V6. So it's the old stalwart 2.8 litre four cylinder diesel that goes into this fight. For now, the Ford Ranger Wildtrak represents the top tier of the Ranger lineup. Performance buyers can look to the race ready Raptor, but the Wildtrak pretty much comes fully stocked. Some of the Wildtrak exclusive features include power adjustable heated front seats, orange interior accents over leather trim, a 12 inch infotainment touchscreen, ambient interior lighting, a powered roller shutter, roof rails, and boulder gray 18 inch wheels with all terrain tires. An optional Wildtrak premium pack fitted here adds matrix LED headlights, full LED tail lights, and a 10 speaker Bang & Olufsen sound system plus a bank of interior auxiliary switches. Later this year, the Wild Track will be usurped as the fanciest Ranger with a new Platinum model, which adds luxury features as seen on the Everest Platinum. If you're looking at a Ranger Wild Track, it comes only as a dual cab with a ute tub on the back. The two liter bi-turbo model is priced from $67,990, while the V6 tested here starts from $71,190, both before on-road costs. V6 Rangers also feature a four-wheel drive system that can be used on and off-road with a 4x4 auto setting, allowing use on all surfaces. It's a bit of an ace up its sleeve and not matched by many competitors. The Rogue currently sits atop the Hilux range with a starting price of $70,200 plus on-road costs. Big changes for the Rogue compared to the regular Hilux range, see it re-engineered for 2023 with new front and rear suspension, bigger front disc brakes, rear disc brakes for the first time on a Hilux, and wider wheel tracks. The engine and powertrain are unchanged, so the Rogue soldiers on with a carryover 2.8 litre turbo diesel, a six speed automatic, and part time dual range 4x4. Despite the pumped up wider styling and boxy wheel arch flares, the Rogue isn't a match for the pumped up Ranger Raptor. It's more of a sheep in wolf's clothing. Inside the Rogue, you'll find an eight inch touchscreen, a nine speaker JBL audio system, a power driver's seat, and front seat heating with leather seat trim. On the outside, there's a powered roller shutter, 18 inch alloy wheels with highway terrain tires, LED head and tail lights, and perhaps unusually, a tub that's lined with hard wearing marine carpet. Later this year, Toyota will have a GR Sport Hilux with a booster power and torque and some unique GR styling touches, taking the top spot from the Rogue in the range. Regardless of whether you opt for the Rogue or Wild Track, you'll find features like dual zone climate control, push button start, proximity key entry, a rear sports bar, and a tow bar. So first, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Why would we compare the four cylinder Hilux to the V6 Ranger, when after all, there is a four cylinder Ranger available as well. Well, the problem is people will tell us that they will basically spend what they can afford. And if these two are in the same price ballpark, even though they're a little bit different, they're gonna go for the top tier every time. And it's the V6 Ranger that wins out, even within the Ranger lineup. 
the wait for the V6 is longer than it is for the four cylinder because the V6 is the one that everyone wants. So with that in mind, we're gonna stick with the V6 Ranger and see how it holds up against the continuing four cylinder Hilux. Under the bonnet of the Hilux, you'll find a 2.8 liter turbo diesel engine, good for 150 kilowatts and 500 Newton meters. In the Hilux Rogue, there's no manual option either. A six speed auto is the only transmission available. Peak torque comes online between 1600 and 2800 RPM, so it's an easy engine to drive, but no match for the Ranger's V6. While it's been improved over the years, it does show some rough edges in refinement, although not enough to completely spoil the driving experience. While it's a similar size at three liters, the Ranger puts down 184 kilowatts and 600 Newton meters, backed by a 10 speed auto. Peak torque spans 1750 to 2250 RPM, but don't make the mistake of thinking that this is a performance engine. It's a low rever. Peak power is available at 3250 RPM. So rather than buying the Ranger V6 as a red light winner, you're buying this because it can tow and haul much more effortlessly. Well, let me preface this by saying that some of these criticisms may not apply to you, but if you're buying the Hilux Rogue, I reckon they probably do, because if you want a basic workhorse, you're probably gonna buy a Hilux SR. So let's dive in. This interior is kind of chock full of hard plastics. Top of the doors, top of the dash, everything is uh, hard wearing and it kind of proves that the Hilux started life as a workhorse rather than as a luxury car. That's really probably not a bad thing. And if you're gonna screw in equipment and radios and brackets and things like that to your interior, you're not gonna feel too bad about doing that. Looking around the cabin, you get analog gauges. So you've got a regular Speedo and Taco, but with a small digital display in the middle. You get an eight inch infotainment screen, and that comes with wired CarPlay and Android Auto, but no wireless. It's got nav built in, but it's also got some lockout functions so that when you're driving, you can't use the system on the go. Other than that, you get two cup holders in the front here. You get two glove boxes and the top one is cooled. There's a small amount of storage in the center console and you get leather seat trim and heated leather seats. But again, in a step that you don't often see, the heated seats are either on or off. And in most cars, you get two or three stage control. So you can pick a low, medium or high setting. On top of that, you get a black headlining, I guess for sporty looks, gunmetal gray across the dash and some shiny black plastics. Now we noticed when we picked this car up today that the black plastics are super prone to like fingerprints and smudges. So you're probably gonna notice that the interior looks a lot dirtier than it actually is. And again, this is a high spec model, not the workhorse. So you get carpet flooring and carpet floor mats. You can of course put rubber mats in it. Other than that, I actually think the driving position is pretty good. Toyota has the right kind of balance between steering wheel, pedals and seat. It's easy to find a comfortable position. To me, the seats are maybe a little bit firm uh, and it's probably because of a, let's call it a lack of padding. Other than that though, it's a good enough environment to be in and I think that you will easily settle in and find the right position for you. All right, I'm gonna call it a case of age before beauty, but whereas the Hilux was quite utilitarian, the Ranger is a really nice place to spend time. And if you're buying a ute as a premium ute, this is the one that nails the brief. It's got soft touch finishes on the tops of the doors, on the middles of the doors, and on select parts of the dash. As well as that, it's got a few things that are kind of doubled up with the Hilux. You get a top glove box and you get a bottom glove box, but there's an ace up the sleeve here. There's a little storage spot in front of the passenger. There are cup holders on the outside of the dash. They kind of pop out and you get the same in the Hilux. There are cup holders in the center console but storage goes a little bit further still. There's a wireless charge pad here. You don't get one of those in the Hilux. There's room for your keys or your wallet. And there's a slightly bigger, but not by much, center console. And another little uh, Ranger play, I'll call it, is the well-known, and you've probably seen it by now, chip holder that exists in the center console. Uh, I'm not always traveling with a packet of hot chips. So again, whether you want to slot your keys in there, chuck a couple of pens in there, whatever, it's up to you. In terms of the fit and finish of the interior, it's all really nice. And you'll notice that the seats are a little bit more detailed and intricate. The, uh, the seat fabric itself is, again, 
I'm going to say leather, but it's probably a mix of both. But you get orange stitching here, you get wild track embroidery on the seats, there's little detail inlays, and a few nicer features like that. When it comes to screen real estate, Ranger wins the game again. There's an eight inch digital display for the instruments, and that's configurable in a couple of different ways. So you can choose the information that you get there. And there's a massive 12 inch tablet style display that takes care of infotainment. Now that breaks down to media at the top, and you can use that for car settings and things like that. Plus it's got a dedicated climate control screen at the bottom. Then below that, there's hard buttons for the climate control as well. So you can access basic functions like the temperature and fan speed and things like that. Now, I know I mentioned it before, but instead of on off for the heated seats, there are three stage heated seats here. So you can choose if you want your bum warm, warmer or warmest. Again, you're looking at a fairly dark interior. You've got a black headlining, black leather, black everything apart from the orange highlights. But I think uh, on balance, this shows as the more modern interior and uh, one little call out that isn't modern, because if you know old fashioned Falcons, you'll know that this has had its birth a long, long time ago. The door handles, not on the door, they're in the door grip here. You just give them a squeeze and push. Sounds like a small thing, but ergonomically, it makes a ton of sense when you go to get in and out of the car. You don't have to reach up, pull and push. You kind of do it all as one single action. So on ergonomics, I think there are a lot of similarities. Features, there are a lot of similarities. But then Ranger pulls some clear air when it comes to thoughtful little details. And this car with the Wild Track Premium Pack comes with these auxiliary switches. Don't do anything right now, but if you add in accessory equipment, you can wire them up through factory switches and not have an array of different aftermarket connectors dotted around your dash. Just like it is in the front, the Hilux is a little bit bearer of the two in the back, but that doesn't mean that it goes without. Uh, again, you only get hard door plastics, everywhere. There are a pair of air vents in the back of the center console, but there's no USB charging for backseat occupants and no 12 volt plug. So they're gonna have to ask very nicely if they can use the one USB up front if they need to charge anything. Hilux has got little takeaway hooks on the back of each front seat. So you can hang a bag there and keep it in place. Called a curry hook for a reason. Definitely handy to keep your curry upright and from spilling all over the floor. Other than that, there's not too much to talk about back here. Now, I'm 169 centimetres tall. I find myself a little close to the headlining, but not too bad. I've got plenty of leg room. That's down to my height, so kids or teenagers will have a great time back here, although there's not a lot of room under the front seat for your toes. Other than that, the seat position is quite upright, so it's kind of, you know, bolt upright. This is one for short trips. I wouldn't recommend it for doing the cross-country jaunt where you're going to spend hours and hours with passengers in the back seat. There is a fold-down armrest here and it comes with a pair of cup holders plus there's a little gap in between which means you can put a mug or rest your phone in there if you want but in terms of features that's about all you get. With me out of the back seat you can see that the backrest doesn't fold up but the seat base does. Now it's got a 60-40 split and you'll see that the floor is flat and fully carpeted underneath. So if you're carrying anything tall, you can throw it in floor to ceiling. There's also little lift up covers under here. Now on this side, it's got the jack and some of the tools. So you've got access to those there, but the recesses, there's one on each side. So while you can use these for a bit of occasional storage, you probably not gonna put anything too big or awkward in there. Jump into the back of the Ranger and just like the front, it is pretty nice back here, but surprising no one, it isn't as fancy as the front row. That said, you do get quite a bit back here. So there's vents for the rear seat occupants. There is a USB-C and a USB-A charging port. There are map pockets on the back of each front seat. Plus, uh, there's a little pocket in the leading edge of the rear seat, so you can shove your phone in there if you want. There's a fold down armrest and it's got two cup holders in there. And if you're looking for your coat hooks, they're not up in the ceiling where you would get in, but they're behind you, so you can hang your jacket up here. Other than that, you get a small assist handle to help you get in, and of course, uh, the Jesus bar above your head. The trims are the same sort of leather with orange contrast stitching, but the door trim misses out on the soft touches on the top. Other than that, it's padded here, and everything else is pretty much as you would find in the front seat. Not as many toys to play with, but still plenty packed in. Now, I'm not tall, as I mentioned, so for me, behind my driving position, plenty of leg room. If you're putting kids or young teenagers back here, they will fit right in. Bigger adults, and partic particularly behind taller drivers, 
may have a harder time squeezing in, knee rim's gonna be a little bit tight, and the rear seat backrest can't be adjusted, and it's quite upright. I don't mind it, and it's all right for a short trip, but if you're doing three or four hours on the road, I reckon your rear seat passengers might start to grumble a little bit. Now, as well as all of that, there's a few more features about the back seat that don't involve me sitting in it. Let's have a look at those. Behind the backrest, when you flip it forward, you'll find access to the two top tether points for child seats, and they go with Isofix in the seat cushion. As well as that, there is a subwoofer hiding behind the rear seat, and that's where your tools are, so if you need to get access to your jack, you'll find it there. Underneath the seat, when you flip up the base, you'll find two fairly deep storage recesses. Now these are handy if you wanna maybe keep recovery gear or things that you don't use too often. Uh, it's also handy if you're sick of barking your shins on the tow bar, you can pop it in here. This one is lined, this one is not. But other than that, it's a, a good handy spot to keep some of your less often used but still essential items. I've said it before, but I will say it again, this probably isn't your best choice as a work ute because between the powered roller cover on the tailgate and a tub that's carpet lined, this isn't gonna be the thing that you wanna haul dirt and uh, tools with. It's not gonna hold up to that too well. That said, this is marine carpet and it is meant to be washable. It is removable so that you can take care of it if it does get a little bit grubby. Ultimately though, think of it as a big boot. There's LED lighting here. You've got a couple of tie down points and you've got a 12 volt plug as well. Worth pointing out too that this tailgate doesn't have an assist spring and it isn't damped. So it's pretty heavy to get up and down. And uh, if you're like me or my crew today, you're gonna drop it a bunch of times because when you see what the Ranger has, you'll understand why we keep forgetting that this tailgate is like it is. All right, so those things that I talked about that you find in the tub, they add 23 kilos to the tear weight of the Hilux compared to an SR5. So that means that the tear weight of this one is 2,196 kilos. That also means that the gross vehicle mass of this car doesn't change compared to other Hilux models, and that's 3,050 kilograms. Once you take the extras out of your carrying capacity, you get a payload of 854 kilograms. Now, I don't know what you're gonna put that's 854 kilos and suitable for a carpeted tub, but that's up to you. Both of these utes have a maximum towing capacity of 3,500 kilograms, and that's pretty standard in the ute class. However, the gross combination mass of the Hilux is 5,850 kilos for the car and whatever you're towing. Head to the back of the Ranger, and there's a bunch of cool touches that the Hilux misses out on. One of those is the tailgate. It's countersprung, so you can raise and lower it with one finger. A lot easier to use. It's also got a powered roller cover, but this one, can be operated off the key. So you don't need to use the buttons, you can unlock it as you approach. Inside this particular ute, there's a plastic bed liner. Now there's a spray and tub liner in other members of the Ranger family, but you get some fun little features that Ford has included to improve the workability of this ute. Now again, top spec ute, maybe not the most work inclined, but you can clamp to the tailgate, so there's little spots there that you can clamp down to. Plus, if you don't get the plastic bed liner, spray and tub liner utes have a ruler that runs across the tailgate. And this one's actually still here, but it's under the rubber seal for the tub liner. Tub liner itself has got uh, little cup holders. So if you're into tailgate parties, you can put your can of soft drink there. On top of that, it's got adjustable sliding rails in the tub and a 12 volt power socket so that you can recharge or run lights out of the tub if you like. Now, let's talk facts and figures. Overall, the Ranger is a little bit heftier than the Hilux. It has a tear weight of 2,335 kilograms, but the payload is almost 100 kilograms more generous. It's 951 kilos that you can shove in the back of the Ranger. The Wildtrak V6 has a GVM, or a gross vehicle mass, of 3,350 kilos. But if you're towing, you'll need to stay under a gross combination mass of 6,400 kilograms. And there's one more thing. The Rangers engineers worked out that you can't use a bumper step to get in and out of the back of the ute if you've got the tailgate down. So if you don't wanna enter from that side, there's a step built into the side of the Ranger tub so you can lean in and grab anything that's moved out of the way. The Rogue has had a few safety bumps to go with the most recent styling updates. Most notably blind spot monitoring, 
rear cross traffic alert and a 360 degree camera system. Lane departure alert, lane keeping assist via braking rather than the more typical steering assist, autonomous emergency braking with cyclist and pedestrian detection, traffic sign recognition and seven airbags carry over from before. The Hilux has dropped off the pace a little with adaptive cruise control that drops out at low speeds, handing back over to the driver and no reverse AEB to assist when parking. The Hilux carries a five star ANCAP safety rating and was retested in 2019 to uphold that rating in line with safety updates at the time. It probably comes as no surprise, but the newer Ranger also gets a more modern safety suite. The Ranger comes with features like autonomous emergency braking with cyclist, pedestrian and intersection intervention, adaptive cruise control and speed sign recognition that are linked so that you can match cruise or the speed limiter to the current speed zone. A more advanced lane keeping assist system can nudge the car back into its lane via the steering. Plus there's blind spot monitoring, lane departure warning, tire pressure monitoring, a 360 degree camera, nine airbags, including one between the front seat occupants, and even a trailer light test function so you can get out and check trailer lighting without another person to help. ANCAP testing in 2022 yielded a five star result. If you are looking for the dependable weekender, then the Hilux is probably the way to go. Now, you will see these as far and away the most popular 4x4 ute around Australia, and it's not hard to see why. The 4x4 course that we're on here isn't the most demanding in the world. So I'm gonna say that we're giving this the, uh, the weekender treatment, right? This is a car that you drive to and from work run the kids around on the weekends and then take camping when you get that urge to get away from it all. So what do you get in the Hilux? Well, it comes with a old school uh, four wheel drive system that has two wheel drive, four wheel drive high and four wheel drive low modes. So I'm already in four high as I uh, head around this tight bend and up this little incline. But again, there's nothing here that's too challenging overall. What you do get though, is a decent groundswell of torque. It's available pretty much just above idle. So it means that starting off on um, an incline or on loose surfaces is pretty bloody easy to do. The suspension changes that Toyota have made to the Hilux Rogue give it a more planted stance. And so it feels a little bit less kind of um, seesawy as you go through some of the undulations that we have around here. But overall, it's pretty stable and solid, I have to admit. The one thing is though, we've got it very lightly laden. There's a bit of camera gear in the back and uh, some recovery equipment, but not much more than that. So it is pretty bouncy. Um, you don't get a nice everything ironed out air suspension ride. You've still got leaf springs in the rear, coil springs up front. It's an independent front suspension and a rigid rear, which is pretty much par for the course in nearly all utes. The six speed automatic gearbox in the Hilux is, uh, I'm gonna say not the sharpest tool in the shed and it does work all right, but if you're off-roading and in situations like this, you may find that from time to time, it can drop you into a little bit of a torque hole. Now, as I said before, there's plenty of torque and it's available across a pretty wide band, but it does mean that uh, if you're sitting above 3000 RPM and leave the transmission to its own devices, Uphill it can change up and leave you a little bit short. Of course, you do have a manual mode, so you can throw it into manual mode, pick your own gear, and that's not a problem. Conversely, as we'll talk about in the Ranger, it's got a 10 speed auto, which means that you can do uh, much smaller steps between ratios and keep that rev gap much, much smaller. So a little bit more useful in that regard. Uh, in terms of off-roading software and help uh, and things like that, there isn't any in this. Basically your four wheel drive modes are all you have. Uh, two high, four high and four low. You don't get mud, sand and rut modes. You don't get uh, electronic stability assistance for uh, uh, different surfaces. So really it sort of comes down to what the driver is doing up here uh, to make sure that you get through the terrain in the right way. That said, there is uh, traction control on board, of course. 
um, and there is a locking rear differential. So when the going gets really tough, you can lock that in and keep things moving along. Definitely worth noting too that underneath the Hilux, you get a set of highway terrain tires. Now Rogue isn't made as a all conquering four x four machine. Yes, it is a four wheel drive ute. And yes, you can take it a lot of places if you so desire, but this isn't the ultimate off-roader in factory spec. If you want to, you can certainly change those tires and I probably would suggest it if you intend to go, you know, far beyond kind of fire trails and dirt tracks like this. Other than that, these tires have been all right today, but there's no water around and this is a fairly clay heavy surface. So uh, once things get muddy, these highway terrains aren't gonna get you too far. That said, they are pretty good on the road and we'll talk about that in a second as well. Final shout out to, to Toyota's air conditioning system. And I know that sounds like a weird thing to call out, but Toyota AC in just about any car is blisteringly cold when you need it to be. Again, we haven't got the hottest day that you'll find today, but we do have a warm one and it's pretty good in here. Uh, a lot of days you'll have it set to 22 degrees and still find that you are too cool. It's rapid and it's efficient and it's really handy to have when you're a long way from the nearest cold drink. Shout out to the new Ford Ranger. If you swap drivers and the person that got out of the car takes the key with them, you can't shift this car out of park and it warns you on the dash. So you're not going to get to your destination and find that your co-worker took off with the keys. Handy feature to have, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about how this goes off-road. And I have to say, compared to the Hilux, this is a lot softer riding. So it kind of more gracefully runs over hills, but it has a problem, and it's that. What you heard just then is the side steps of this car bottoming out. The Ranger has 234 millimeters of ground clearance. The Hilux has 265. It's a lot higher off the ground. Now, both of those are factory figures, and we reckon that Toyotas might be a little bit generous. However, the difference shows, and it shows around here quite a lot. Something else that's not as good about the Ranger is its little electronic E shifter for the automatic. It doesn't have really clear detents between reverse and park in particular. So trying to do a three point turn like the one I've just done here, you tend to knock it into park when you really want reverse. It's a little bit frustrating, but it's not the end of the world. And with time, you do get a little bit more used to it. Now, in the same way that the ride in this is a lot gentler, I have to say that the engine and the throttle calibration is a lot gentler too. And what do I mean by that? Well, I think it's basically a side effect of this V6 having more torque on tap than that four cylinder. So it means that you don't have to roll on and off the throttle as aggressively. You can kind of just let this car make its own way through. A little bit of throttle gets you a long way. That extra torque really makes itself known. It's also just a little bit more refined. So there's a bit less thrash and a bit less noise. When it comes to hilly terrain, and in particular heading uphill, the 10-speed auto in the Ranger, where it can sort of jump between gears and not quite know what it's doing around town, tends to do a much better job out here. But again, you're only doing slow off-road work. So that makes sense. The big thing though, is that it tends to jump between ratios and keep revs in what I would call the absolute sweet spot, making it a whole lot easier to uh, keep momentum and keep things going nicely. Now, within its artillery, the Wild Track has uh, a couple of different off-road modes. So you can set it for mud and ruts or gravel or sand, which makes the off-road going a little bit easier. There's a locking rear diff in this car, and there's a few extra functions, like in the dashboard, you have uh, your roll angles displayed and things like that. So it's a little bit more helpful off-road. Far and away, though, the most helpful thing for terrain that you're not familiar with or you're trying to pick your way through is the 360 degree camera. Now, Hilux has got one as well, so it's not alone in that feature, but the definition of this camera is far better. So you get a much better idea of what's coming up and it's a lot easier to see where the road drops away and where you should or shouldn't put your wheels. All right, away from the fun stuff, we've put the dirt and gravel behind us and we're out on the open road. So, this probably won't be the way that you use your Hilux every single day if you live in town, if you live out of town, this is probably what it looks like for you to get to and from work. There's some things that immediately pop up and this car uh, 
you know, age isn't its, uh, its friend here. It's a little bit noisier, you get a little bit more wind noise, you get a little bit more engine noise, and that six-speed auto comes into play here because if you ask for a burst of acceleration, it's got to rev hard. And then if you pick that up then, and then, but it's got to kick down a couple of times to kind of get itself uphill. That's not the worst thing in the world. It just doesn't have the, uh, the choice of ratios that the, uh, the Ranger has. There's a little bit more wind noise and you kind of eats away at you on a longer trip. You'll probably be fine if you're doing short hops here and there. It's just definitely not as well honed as the Ranger is. And you feel that in a number of ways. The suspension has a bit more bounce in it. And again, we're using these unladen. Once you put a weight into them, they behave a little bit differently. But uh, no matter what you do, the Hilux always just has that little bit of jitter and that little bit of bounce. There's been plenty of work done to the suspension on this car, but it almost feels like most of it was for appearance. Wider tracks and therefore wider guards are kind of, you know, speaking to the market, but uh, I don't know if they speak to the comfort of your rear end. Be that as it may, there's other issues at play here too. I don't know if you heard the beeping just then, but that's the lane assist system in this car. And rather than uh, being able to intervene with steering and nudge you back into your lane, it's an older style system that uses wheels to basically uh, break the inside wheel and drag you back towards uh, the direction that you should be in if you wander out of your lane. Not an ideal solution, but better than nothing at all. Put it all together and it's just hard to hide that the Hilux is one of the oldest utes in its class. It's got a replacement coming, but it's a couple of years away. So this is likely to see you through until that next one lands. Got your heart set on a Hilux, that's great. And let's face it, there are buyers that like the fact that this car is a little bit lower tech. If you're one of those buyers, I reckon you'll get along just fine, but you can't avoid tech entirely. This car has it, whether you like it or not. Now, if you're uh, a little bit old fashioned and that isn't the sort of thing that appeals to you, this is the lesser of two evils in that regard, but it isn't the complete, there's nothing here to, uh, to go wrong kind of uh, suite of technology, i.e. none. That said, I reckon once you put something on the tow bar of this or you fill up the tray, it's gonna be all right. It will do the job for you but I don't think it will do the job for you quite as nicely, quite as adeptly, quite as comfortably, and quite as quietly as the Ranger will. But we'll have a look at that one in a sec. Would I recommend that you steer clear of the Hilux based on our off-road and our on-road driving? No, not at all. Uh, would I recommend that you look very closely at what else you could get as a potential competitor? Definitely, I reckon you're gonna wanna make sure that as well as putting some seat time in on a Hilux, have a look around the class and see what else you can get. Hilux may have been a cornerstone of the segment for a really long time, but I think some of the competitors have done their homework and have brought themselves up to speed. If you were gonna pick either of these pair as a tourer, if you're doing the big lap around Australia, or if you're just gonna spend a lot of time behind the wheel, on the bitumen, this is the car that I would probably lean to. There's something about the way that Ford has tuned the new Ranger that makes it absolutely perfect for rural roads. At the moment, I'm cruising along at 100 k's an hour, wind noise is really low, engine noise drops right away once you're out of the rev band, and it's just a nice thing to drive around in. I even reckon that the Ranger rides a little bit nicer than the Everest. And I know that not everyone is probably going to agree with me, but the coil sprung Everest is just a little bit more jittery than the Ranger, whether that's because it has a longer wheelbase or what, I don't quite know. But this is just such a nice thing to drive. Now talking about that V6 under the bonnet, has some pretty good figures, as I've mentioned, but it's not a quick engine, right? It's got a lot of torque and that's its party trick. It isn't designed to go fast. So if you're thinking that you're going to buy it for that reason, try again, like buy the Raptor, that's the car that goes fast. This is, uh, I guess, more about having something up your sleeve, whether that's rolling overtaking or, uh, you know, towing, hauling, full payload, if you're gonna put a toolbox on the back of this and 
have 700 kilos of tools with you at all times, then I would probably opt for the V6. It's then that it makes the difference. Around town and in, you know, start, stop driving and in the city, this is probably the little bit nicer too. I know that you've probably heard some complaints about the 10 speed auto, but the way I drive, I don't get them. And whether that's because I'm a little bit more relaxed or what, I don't know, uh, but it just seems to work really well. And same as when we were driving off-road, it has the ability to pick ratios and not put big gaps into the rev band and leave you kind of waiting for the engine to spool up. It's on boost and in torque pretty much all the time, which is very handy to have. Crucially, the handling of this car, and when I say handling, I don't mean racetrack style, I mean sitting on an open road with a few flowing bends. This car has nicely weighted steering and it doesn't sort of wander from side to side in a lane. It's just planted and pretty easy to live with. To go with that, the safety systems are pretty impressive too. And there's a lot of advancement in this area. I know that some of you are gonna say, if you need safety systems, you probably shouldn't be driving. Okay, yes and no. The fundamentals of driving, you should definitely have down pat, but at the same time, this uh, has lane keep assist that functions really well, keeps you in your lane, doesn't intervene unnecessarily, and has some few safety features that the Hilux doesn't have. Things like AEB that can stop you entering an intersection if a car's about to cross your path. Reverse AEB, so that you don't hit something while you're reversing. Has a better 360 degree camera. It has actual lane assist as opposed to one that just sort of nudges you between lanes. And because this car is developed in Australia, it gets Australian conditions. Road markings that aren't quite clear, it can handle them. And it doesn't sort of flag false alerts. Now, the one thing I'm gonna say is I'm not too sure how or what the AEB is gonna throw up uh, if you come across ruse. And we know that they're pretty tricky to deal with, right? They're erratic and they don't quite behave like other animals or like people. So that's the one question mark that I have right now. But in every other aspect, it works really well. From the adaptive cruise control, to the lane assist system, to the blind spot monitoring, it all does what it should do. Hilux servicing at $260 a visit sounds very reasonable, but intervals are every six months, so the annual cost is $520 per year. It's still not bad, but the fees go up after the third year to $1,043 in year four and $913 in year five. So that's an average of $703 a year over five years. Toyota's warranty term starts at five years. Private buyers don't have a kilometre limit, but commercial users get a 160,000 kilometre cap applied. Private buyers also get a warranty extension of up to two years for engine and driveline on cars serviced according to Toyota's maintenance schedule. Official fuel consumption for the Hilux is 8.4 litres per 100 k's, but on test this week we've returned 10.6 litres per 100 in a mix of urban, highway and off-road use. Higher than the claim, but still not too bad. Ford also offers a five-year unlimited kilometre warranty, but doesn't impose a limit for commercial use. Ford's cap price service program runs for four years, and service visits are annually or every 15,000 Ks. Each of those first four service visits is priced at $329. The potential downside here, despite the lower maintenance costs, is that the V6 Ranger is a bit more thirsty than the Hilux. While it has the same 8.4 litre per 100 kilometre official fuel consumption claim, our testing here is sitting on 11.3 litres per 100 k's. Again, that's in a mix of urban, highway and off-road driving, but because you've got more urge at your disposal, it feels like you're more inclined to tap into it and returning higher fuel consumption as a result. Well, it's always good to get out of the office and hit the trails, which is a pretty good segue. What are you gonna do with your ute? Are you using it for the school run? Are you commuting to work? And are you heading off road for the occasional weekend when the spirit of adventure takes you? Or is your ute a workhorse? Are you crossing the Simpson Desert? Are you actually gonna put it through some hard graft? Well, ultimately you could probably build either of these up to do any of those jobs but we've noticed a couple of things today. Now, the better ground clearance of the Hilux really lends itself to some of this off-road work. However, 
the highway terrain tires that come on it from standard don't so you would need to swap those out and i reckon if you're really going to go hardcore off-road you're going to want to do that anyway the one thing that you will need to do with the ranger that you probably wouldn't with the hilux is lift it up that extra bit of ground clearance in the rogue just makes it easier to live with off-road now there's some yawning differences between these two cars and a lot of that comes down to age the hilux is a much older model than the ranger the ranger only landed last year and it really shows it has a more impressive interior it has more impressive refinement it's quieter and softer riding the ride itself especially on road not off stands out this is a ute that handles like an suv and if you're doing long miles you're really going to notice that the elephant in the room is the v6 engine the ranger's extra power helps a lot and i've said it before it's not a quick ute it's just an effortless ute so that means that if you've got the tub full or you're towing you're not going to notice the car struggle as much is there a winner well unfortunately there always has to be someone that comes off second best the running costs are a little bit higher the fuel use though is a touch lower but when you put it all together the hilux funny that it should be painted silver gets the second place medal in this instance and our winner is the ford ranger for a number of reasons it's just easier to live with day to day and i think there's some really clever tech solutions that push it above not only the hilux but any other ute that you can get in australia right now of course you're going to have your own thoughts on that so we'd love to hear from you in the comments drop us a line below and let us know are you team hilux or team ranger or is there another ute that you have on your shopping list as well as that while you're here if you haven't yet please subscribe to the youtube channel and if you would like the full written review on these cars plus a ton of other reviews news and car culture stories head to drive.com.au